Hi, everybody. This is DJ, and I am very pleased to have a special guest joining me today. This is Janelle J. Quays, the author, designer for Caverns of Thracia, published by Judges Guild in 1979. Um, and I've got Janelle on right now because my group is about to start a run of Caverns of Thracia, and I thought it would be awesome to ask her some questions about it and dig in. Thank you for joining me, Janelle. Oh, you're very welcome. I don't get a chance to talk specifically about some adventures. Awesome. Um, so, so just to just to lay a little groundwork, we're we're going to talk a little bit about just sort of right out like we're going to talk about OD and D a little bit. Um, some of your early career, how you got started in, through mm-hmm. Judges Guild and TSR, uh, and then we'll dig into just some things about Cavern. This this module, Caverns of Thracia. Did you okay. even call, call them modules back then? That's sort of the the term that it came to be, and now they're not even that anymore. It's like adventures I'm now. Trying to remember if we called them modules when at this point in time, uh, at that point in time. Modules more came about as a term when TSR realized they could make money doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that that's when the term module came into being. Yeah. Um, I think we just called them adventures. I'm not certain. It's Okay. That's funny. It's sort of back to adventures now. They don't they don't even yeah. call modules these days. Um, so my group we're playing uh, 1974 OD&D rules. Here are my Oh my god. Original copies of the white box. Uh, they <laughs> the uh, center page is falling out because the, the 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 staple has rusted through now. <laughs> Sounds like my copies. Yeah, um, and we're having a blast in it. I I I was born in seventy four, so about within two weeks of D and D being released. So January nineteen seventy four. Um, so I never played OD and D back in the day. I got my start in the Menser um, Red Box set. Okay. So we're kind of going back in time. We're doing a, a fun little like uh, sort of push through publishing order. So we started with a match of Chainmail. We're introducing OD and D, and we just finished Palace of Vampire Queen, the first ever adventure for D and D published mm-hmm. uh, that I'm aware of. And yeah, beat me by two weeks. Oh really? <laughs> Beat me by two weeks. Oh man, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, and I just saw one uh, got scooped up on one of the uh, Facebook groups. An original copy of *Palace of the Vampire Queen*. I'm sure that's worth uh, quite a bit these days. Yeah, um, they, were, they were. I remember seeing them in stores. They were literally black. If I remember them back then, they were black folders with a label on the front, and stuck inside were computer printouts. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's they, what I remember. <laughs> that's exactly right. It wasn't even a bound book or anything. Pretty amazing. Um, so we just finished Palace of the Vamp- Vamp- Vampire Queen. We got through it in 20 sessions, um, and we're oh kicking off. Um, we're going to do one we're, little tangent into Judges Guild and with Caverns of Thracia, and then we're going to do start in the G-Series and just sort of go through, in publishing order, the adventures that TSR put out uh, okay. back in the day. Um so before we sort of dig in uh, and talk about OD&D stuff, the movie just came out. Um, what would you think? I enjoyed the heck out of it. It was, it was literally like a love story. For me, it was like a love story written to D&D gamers of the late 80s and early 90s. Yeah. Um, which was my second time period of being in um, working in fantasy role-playing games. Yeah, they they touched a lot of things that touched that era of gaming. Yeah, it, yeah, I, I I loved it too. I I was kind of emotional, <laughs> like most watching most of it. Just like having spent so much time in these places in Icewind Dale, and then you know Neverwinter. Like, yeah, it was just kind of amazing to see it all realized and in, in, in real life yeah. in front of your eyes. Pretty amazing. My one claim to fame in that movie, and I went and verified it after the movie was done, the barbarian character Holda. She came from the Elk tribe there along the Sword Sword Coast. Yeah. I created that barbarian group. Really? (laughs) For for Forgotten Realms. It's part of um, the um, source book I wrote for that area of, of the Forgotten Realms. It was uh, FR5, um, Savage Frontier. 
Yeah, yeah, with the uh, the orc on the horse on the cover. I think I think it I is. think that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah, like just just little de- seeing little details like that, and like she's just like, oh yeah, I'm from the elk tribe, and and I'm playing through uh, in another session. Um, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden right now, a five E Forgotten Realms adventure, and it takes place there, and the elk tribe is in it. <laughs> and, uh, so that's just a treat to just like, yeah. I'm also playing Out of the Abyss, and the big fat dragon just betrayed my players in another <laughs> session I'm running. So that was just so awesome to see all these things that I, we've been interacting with now just kind of presented. Very cool. Um, so let's go back to to OD and D a little bit. This is all new and fresh to me. So you know the rules are 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 rough. They're they're <laughs> they're a little wonky and. Um, but we're having a blast playing it, and uh, there's a few things that have come up in our games that, that uh, we're wondering, like, are we even doing this right? And uh, when's the last time you played uh, OD&D, or are you playing different OSR things these Ooh, days? Ooh, last time I played OD&D, let's say 19... 19- 77 maybe okay so yeah back back then <laughs> because w- that's when the player's handbook came out and we started slowly rolling into being a dnd yeah so all these all these questions are are fresh in my head right now because we've just run through mm-hmm. the rules and have been playing it and been confused about the things but here, here's a here's a couple of questions that have come up for us i don't know if you have any any uh just thoughts on them but um, one one that's tripped me up a little bit as a DM is is the idea of of real time healing. So so I think a, a, one concept in OD and D was like the intent was between sessions like you went back to town and and you know at first level clerics don't even have a heal spell and so you heal after the second day of rest one hit point a day. So we've been kind of doing that. Uh, so, so the assumption is like, you know, you, you end a session and like, everyone's like, okay, we just pick up and like leave <laughs> and they're at home and they're kind of in real time getting their hit points back. And then the next session starts and like, okay, you arrived again. The monsters are still where they were. So, so here's where it's gotten us into a little, like got me as a DM into a little bit of a trick is I love to, to have cliffhangers at the end of a session. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I don't like to end it at the end of a fight. Um, it's fun when like, you know, they open the door and the reveal of like the big nasty thing they're about to have to deal with. And then, and see you next week. Just like TV shows. Right. So, but, but that is very at odds with the idea that like, then you just left (laughs) and went home and, and healed and came back. So I don't know this, that's something we thought about. I don't know if you've got any, uh, insight or, or, or thoughts about that. The way I remember we played is that particularly at lower levels, you ground as far into your adventure as you could until you were likely, you know, you were, you lost your first character because there was no way you could save them. Um, and then you said, okay, we're done here for now. We're going to retreat um, either back to a safe location or back to our town. Um, that's how I remember playing is that we never, we would sometimes get to a point where it was just we've been playing for hours late and say okay we gotta go to work tomorrow we're gonna we're gonna cut right here not because this is a dramatic point but because we're all really tired yeah (laughs) yeah that makes sense too um uh here's here's another one that that we've that has baffled me a little bit. And, and some of these I've asked to on, on OD&D Facebook groups and got some sort of feedback from how other people played it back in then. But at the very beginning of Men and Magic, it talks about how D&D is for 5 to 50 players. <laughs> so I mistakenly got excited by that and invited everyone <laughs> to come to my first adventure. I'm like, well, let's see what that's like. Well, what are, 50 players, <laughs> how do you do that? You do um, it turns out, I think, you know, I, I sort of pictured, you know, maybe if in, you're in the army or something and everyone's in the mess hall together, okay, you could have a big group like that. Or maybe at a, at a con, there's a tournament and there's, you know, a ton of players there. But how does that, like, who can even fit 
<laughs> fifty people in a space. Okay, this is this is what this is one of my memories from back then. One, my groups tended to be, you know, I went to a small Christian college, so we were lucky if we could scrape up four four to five people for a game. Yeah. Um, later, after college, we tended to meet in a. We had a there was a doctor in the area, and he had a basement in his house and we would set up and play in his house and we would probably get as many as 12 to 15 people there. We split up into two groups running in the same dungeon with different dungeon masters. Okay. That's how we resolved that. Like at the same time or on like different nights of the week kind of same pop- time. Oh, wow. Just, just in like different rooms, different of- parts of the basement it was, well, we lived in, you know, this is the Midwest. We had ranch style homes basements were long and narrow yeah so they were at one end we were at the other yeah awesome (laughs) very cool um here's a question od and d old school gaming can you talk about what what are things that you love about that sort of old style osr uh D &D that's that's kind of like not the same now in, in more modern editions um where i kind of went went from it is um I felt there was more design freedom when working with a OD and D, um, the original D and D rules, because the whole intent of the changeover to A D and D, um, you know, other than the TSR trying to cut uh, Dave Arneson out of royalties, um, was to codify the rules for tournament play, so that everyone. If you went to a tournament, and tournaments were big back in the late 70s. If you went to a tournament and you were playing against 100 other players, everybody was using the same rules as written. Yeah. And having played in an AD&D tournament at a Gen Con once, yeah, you want you want to feel that you're on a level playing ground. Because otherwise with od and it was house rules, you know, house yeah. rules rule. <laughs> yeah. If, you needed it was more rulings than rules like okay i can do this and this and i'm shooting while standing on my head um okay give me a roll yeah i like that you can do that yeah yeah that's kind of what we do too there isn't any there isn't even codified like ability checks in in od and d like people like roll under it it came came to be kind of how and, and in fact in caverns you ask for that sometimes too, so I don't know if that that just kind of like organically became how I people that, do it. Or it was how that was for us. I mean, just so you understand, when I was writing these modules, I was not at Judges Guild. I was not a part of their culture. I worked in uh, my bedroom in or in my small apartment up in Michigan. Um, and contributed my work from there by mail. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We didn't have things like internet back then. <laughs> right. <laughs> or video conferencing. Anyway. Or video con- I mean, <laughs> yeah. I had a telephone and stamps. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Um, XP in, in OD&D. Uh, like... So, so in in the original one, you essentially in, in sort of just the core white box rules, you got a hundred XP per level of monster, more or less. Mm-hmm. And then in Greyhawk, in the Greyhawk supplement, Gary, Mister Gaiax comes out and says, like, "Oh my God, that that was absurd. That's way too much XP." A tenth it. <laughs> so like now you're getting ten XP. And when we introduced the Greyhawk rules, we're like, "Oh man." We we've already have, so so our our group has been from, on the low end six players. We've had up to fifteen players in the room, um, and so the XP that they're getting is already very dis, you know s- spread thin across lots right. of players, and I'm like, so if if we drop it to if they kill a first level monster and it's ten XP, that means everyone's getting one XP <laughs> for the kill. We ended up not doing that. We I just left it with the hundred XP. I, I don't know. Well, again. If you're if you're working since you're actually calculating um, the XP based on party strength, not on individuals earning specific, yeah, I mean, a hundred XP for a monster, 
that maybe does translate to 15 XP per person. Yeah. Um, now, there are times where something like, you know, that had half a hit dice, yeah, you might want to grind that down. I think I remember when we were playing, I figured, I, I did a house rule that if you were swinging, if you were doing damage to crowds of kobolds around you, you chop through as many kobolds as you did damage. Oh, so cool. if, you, if you did <laughs> if you did eight points of damage to these half hit dice or quarter hit dice creatures, you plowed through them until you ran out of damage. Yeah, so you yeah. might take out two or three with a swing. I like that one. We might we might introduce that as as a house rule. We're we're gonna start again from from lo- and Cavern Strathia is a four level one characters. Yes, or I think I, so. I think yeah, it it's one or two That's level right. one or two. It it starts out low level and it. As you go down, and what was then classic, you know, Gygax design, is it was supposed to you went down, and each level down was supposed to be um, a an da- a, a upping of danger and, de- and deadliness. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that's really struck us uh, in with ODD is just how how brutalist it is. Like, and and we've been doing like stuff kind of just as the rules say. Stats are are rolled by the DM, so I rolled every player's stats. I don't think many people stuck to that. They let the player. No, we never did. (laughs) But we never did that. We didn't do. um, I think we got over as the we got over the straight, you know, roll in order process very quickly. It was just place, you know, roll roll four dice, take your best three. Okay. Put them where you want to, so you can play a character. Yeah, and AD and D kind of codifies that as as one of the six or so like more favored approaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm debating switching to that for caverns, just in that as we as time has gone on, every session we've introduced a new supplement or strategic review or Dragon Magazine, and whatever whatever new class they've written up in there is has been allowable, but. I don't think one single player ever has rolled the stats for the, that have any of the requirements for any of the classes beyond the like the first four: thief, fighting man, magic user, and cleric. Um, so I'm thinking about maybe going a little looser with stat rolls this time, just so they can try out you know some of yeah. the other weird classes that got introduced: illusionist and and you know yeah. alchemist and and witch was one that just came up in like Dragon Magazine five. That I think some of them are excited to try, but yeah, we had we had one player with with two hit points as a fighting man <laughs> on level one. So it's like every swing of every combat is like a life and death. I'm going to die now, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, but it, man, it was like I kind of dug it because it was just tense. I mean, you can't you can't just run in and you know guns ablaze, and you have to like you know use a lot more strategy. Yeah. I think that's the approach that um, uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics takes, is that you roll up, what, I think is it two or four um, zero-level characters, and you run them through this funnel, and the ones that survive are your PCs to get <laughs> down into the next game. Oh, awesome. I, I'm not aware of that one. That's, that's yeah, I think cool. that's the basic, I think that's the basic um, character creation rule for DCC, is that oh, wow. you start out with, you know, normal people and you take them on an adventure and if they survive they can become first level characters and adventurers oh wow that's awesome it's i understand it's quite brutal <laughs> yeah we we had everyone roll up two characters on the first session because because so that when you die <laughs> and and man has has there ever there's we've probably averaged one to two deaths a session there, there's my first my first game session I ever played, my character died. Yeah. <laughs> it was a magic user. I don't remember their name, but they were left, they were paralyzed by um, a carrion crawler and left behind when the orcs came. Oh, no. Carrion crawlers are brutal. They've got like, what is it, six or eight attacks and, and each one is a paralysis roll. Like, you're not getting out of that. <laughs> I, I love them as a monster, though. I, I love them as a monster. Yeah, and things like that have been kind of nerfed since then. They're a little, you know, every 
poison doesn't kill you necessarily these you know and more yeah more. it's mostly paralysis i think it does paralysis at this point yeah yeah it carry goes process so let's let's go back in time a little bit and and talk about your origin story um uh starting with how did you first find out about D and and play it well i was bitten by a radioactive d6 <laughs> no <laughs> um I was working at the college radio station. Um, I was an, an announcer. Actually, I might have been program director that year. I can't remember. But um, second year in college, I um, was working as an announcer at the college radio station. And my brother, who is actually the gamer in the family, okay, um, he was a subscriber to Avalon Hills, the general magazine, yeah. which was for fans of their military board games which my brother was. But this company down in Texas called Metagaming Concepts sent him a free copy of their magazine, The Space Gamer. It was issue number two, and inside of it were not one, but two reviews of this game called Dungeons and Dragons. And that was like the moment my life changed when he yeah. read them to me <laughs> over the phone. Because the... It was everything that he and I had been doing as younger children, but codified in the game set. And literally, I think I, um, I found the company and we ordered from their cat. Their, they also sold games, so we ordered the game rules directly from them. And this was probably either early October, maybe. And by Thanksgiving, I believe, we had gotten a copy of not the full rules, but Greyhawk. Oh, Greyhawk. No. <laughs> and my brother had ordered the, this early edition of Tunnels and Trolls. Okay. So our exposure to D&D was first through Greyhawk. That's how we understood it. So there were a lot of things in it we didn't understand, but boy, were we excited about where what we saw! In it. <laughs> awesome. And, and then my first game I actually that. played. My first game I actually played was a dungeon that my brother, younger brother, had created for Tunnels and Trolls. Okay. And I think that was over Christmas break. And and how are the three of you at this point? Um, my brother. Well, I was. Um, Let's see, at that point, I was seven, either 18 or 19. Okay. And my brother was, he was a sophomore, I think. Yeah, he would have been a sophomore in high school. So, 15 awesome. maybe. Yeah. And soon you, you begin writing your own <laughs> adventures. Oh, yeah. Dungeoneer was created by you. Uh, tell us yep. about that. How, how, how did you, that, that's kind of a, you know, getting into publishing at a young age <laughs> like that is, is not typical. <laughs> tell us how you came to do that and, well, and, and write Dungeoneer. It was fanzines. <laughs> and, you know, science fiction fanzines have been in place for forever. Yeah. Um, what uh, we got into it is when we lived in kind of what I'll call a gaming desert. Um, the nearest organized game structure of any kind would have been at one of the neighboring universities, which were 45 minutes to an hour away. Um, I went to a small college, the, you know, MS, Michigan State University or Western Michigan or Ann Arbor, uh, U of University of Michigan. They were all 45 minutes away from where I lived. Okay, so those were the gate where the game stores were, and other than D and D at that time, there was literally nothing. So we're thinking, wow, maybe there's a market for people writing their own ideas up and selling it because obviously they've been doing it for war gaming for years. Yeah. So I got two of my other two of my friends, Mark Hendricks and Merle Davenport, and I, we created our own little publishing group called the Fantastic Dungeoning Society and came up with the idea for the name, The Dungeoneer. Um, and we, the three of us wrote the first content for it. I did um, an, an article in a game adventure 
Uh, Merle did something else, and then Mark wrote some fiction, some fiction for it. And I did the I did all the artwork inside of it. We pooled about a hundred bucks to go have it uh, quick printed um, at a local um, uh, quick print shop. <laughs> yeah. Um, and came back with these half size digest magazines, and says, "Okay, now how, now we have to figure out." how to get it into people's hands. And so we started going through all these. Um, we had some apazines that we'd acquired by that point in amateur press associations. And then there were the, the, the military gaming magazines, like the general, where people were looking for players. So what we ended up doing was, is we took about half the print run, which was, I think, close to 100 copies, and we sent them out for free to people that we had, whose addresses we had found who were basically gamers of some sort. Okay. And from that, we got our first subscriptions coming back in. Um, and we also got nasty grams. <laughs> yeah. Some, some, some <laughs> hardcore military history gamer wrote us back and said, don't you ever send me anything like this D&D trash again. <laughs> That's not in the play, <laughs> But, um, yeah, they were, they were upset that we had considered them the market for our game. Yeah. That's wow. That's funny. Yeah. I remember as, as we've been, we've been introducing like the strategic reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that they did it anymore in, in dragon magazine once they switched over, but, there were, yeah, there were listings, and it, it was funny. It's interesting to watch it grow every every issue. Like, there was a listing of, like, here are eight dungeon masters around the country and their addresses. Yep. Hook up with I them. And it just got bigger and bigger over the issues. Strategic Review is one of our sources. Um, yeah. Dragon Magazine and the Dungeoneer published in the same month. Okay. The first, they were, they were, we were both publishing in June of 76. Yeah, Awesome. So. Um, and and from there, you you bounced around between tabletop gaming and and video games uh, a bit. Um, tell us about your first move over to the video game industry, which is where I I currently work. What led to that, and then um, what led to you coming back to tabletop gaming? Well, first of all, I started out. In, I actually started out in tabletop um, after I graduated from college. I was working for a small a small print shop. It was actually the print shop that had been doing some of our. Um, Dungeoneer printing um, because the first print shop had gone out of business. So I ended up working for them as graphic designer doing, you know, paste up with type and wax and press on letters. That was my job. And I did that after graduating for about two months. Okay. <laughs> and then the business at the place I was working dried up because the city had put barricades at the end of the street because they were doing sewer work. And the know. sewer work kept people from getting to their shop. And so they could, didn't have as much walk-in traffic, which means they didn't have as much graphic design, which means they didn't need me. Yeah. So at that point, I kind of, um, I hit up some of my, um, my freelance contacts, people I had met. Um, one of them was Forrest Brown of Martian Metals. Um, the other was um, Chuck uh, Anshell, who I had sold the Dungeoneer to. But by this time, he was working for Judges Guild. He had taken the magazine with him to Judges Guild and went there, and his typesetting machine, which was the real okay. <laughs> thing, um, to Judges Guild, and was the editor, was becoming the editor for their magazine. And he reached out to me once he learned I was unemployed and said, would you want to come down here and work for us? So mid-October, I think the, the thing I remember the most was as I was driving down from our interview, um, Pope Paul died. Okay. That was, wow. So that's the time frame. Okay. <laughs> I remember hearing that on the radio, my little, my little yellow Vega. Okay. <laughs> and I drove... I think it was like seven hours, might even been longer, from where I live down to southern Illinois to Decatur. And I interviewed with the company. Um, 
it went well. They um, they bought some of my other works that I had brought with me and offered me a job working as an artist and designer for minimum wage, which wasn't very much at that time. Yeah. And it was better than I had as any other job opportunity. So I took it, but on the condition that I didn't have to live there. Okay. For so, your, the first remote <laughs> operation. <laughs> nice. Possibly. Um, <laughs> but I went, I went back to my home in Michigan um, and started on the way back. I think I was already thinking of ideas that would become Dark Tower. All right. Um, and so I, drew, I went back home and worked for Judges Guild for a year. One year, everything I did for Judges Guild, I did within one year. Wow. How, how many how many adventures did you put out with them? I wrote, I wrote by myself, um, Dark Tower, Caverns of Thracia, Book of Treasure Maps, um, Hell Pits of Night Fang for uh, RuneQuest. And then I was working on, um, Legendary Duck Tower and other tales when I quit. Okay. And but I had also done I had edited and illustrated uh, Unknown Gods and I did countless pieces of artwork for book covers, game covers, um, adventures. Awesome. So super productive back then. Um, <laughs> plus, I was also doing illustrations for the magazines. Yeah. Uh, so. After that, I went, I left, I was freelancing for about a year after I left. Um, I met a, another designer who's working for Flying Buffalo named Mike Stackpole. Now, Mike Stackpole would have been associated with the Tunnels and Trolls publishing. Um, he and I became at least acquaintances at that point, and we met at a convention in Michigan. About a week later, he calls me up on the phone and says, hey, I'm working on a freelance gig for this company in Hartford, Connecticut called Coleco. They need one more designer who knows their way about around role playing games. And I thought of you. So I went out and interviewed with with Coleco, I think the next week. And they offered they offered me a job during that interview to come and work for them. I think it was for 15 weeks. Okay. And this was like the best money I'd ever made. <laughs> yeah. You're and I took them up on it. <laughs> sure. And then by the end of the, by the end of the contract, um, Mike left, he wanted to go back to Scottsdale and, and be a famous, um, author. And I stayed with Coleco as an employee for the, another five years. Um, four years, four and a half years. Um, working on their game products, which eventually became video games. Yeah, yeah. So what, 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 was, your, what was your job with Coleco? Was it as a designer? Were you, were, did you do programming as well there? No, no. My first, my first, I came in as a designer to come up with ideas for toys and games, um, mostly games. Then when... Um, they brought, started doing the tabletop electronic games, like the tabletop Pac-Man, the tabletop um, Donkey Kong. Um, those are, I was the designer and at least the in-house designer on those. Okay. Um, even for, for, for the Donkey Kong game, I actually did the screen graphics for the um, vacuum fluorescent display. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, that was an interesting uh, technical challenge to do both from how to design those to make it look like it's Mario running across the screen <laughs> and have them be able to run both directions and climb ladders, at least make the player think that's what he was doing. Yeah. So we did those. And then around the summer of uh, 1981, when I had been with, I'd been the comp with the company just, well, maybe it was the fall of 81. They said, Hey, we're going to do a video. We figured out we can make a video game console and do it cheaper than Atari and sell it cheaper than Atari and do it better than Atari and in television. And so we need, so we started working on that. And our first game conversion was Donkey Kong. So um, 
Jay Belsky and I, who was one, he was one of the other designers and also an engineer, he was working on the engineering specs for the console with our engineering department. Um, and I started, we started reverse engineering the game and trying to figure out how it would translate onto a home computer screen at horizontal um, 320 by 200 pixels. Yeah, yeah, because it was it was a vertical screen, and it was arcade, a, it, yeah. it was a vertical because in the arcade they set the uh, the monitor on its on its side. Yeah, <laughs> and so we got we got some flack because the design the design decisions we came up with were to eliminate one of the levels so it still looked like the original game, but it allowed us to do a smaller graphics package because yeah. we could reuse a lot of the pieces. Interesting. Um, so that was the first one, and then when they start, we did we did a mock up for Toy Fair. I did some of the graphics that, for the mock up for the first Toy Fair and the first CES, and then it, the ball got rolling, and suddenly we needed a video game department. And around that time, my, the two other designers I was working with basically said, "Well, we're gonna we're not gonna stick around." And I became the de facto manager of the group. <laughs> All right. And stayed as that till the end. Till the end. Manager and then um, lead designer, uh, chief designer, and then um, finally director of design when, I, when, I, when, when they kicked us out. Awesome. Um, so... <laughs> I put together, and my job was putting together the art and design groups, training them, and then managing their output creatively and schedule-wise, etc., um, till the end of the ColecoVision and the Atom era. Awesome. I still have a ColecoVision uh, that I believe still is operable. Uh, <laughs> Ladybug, I think that was my favorite ColecoVision. Oh, I game. love Ladybug. I, <laughs> I did work on. Well, I worked on that one too because, like, technically, I worked on everything. Yeah, <laughs> I had my hand in everything. So, so from there, you ended up back into uh, tabletop role playing games, right? Was that? Yeah, was that about a year. This was, uh, they shut us down in '85. I went to work for a local, basically for my former boss at Coleco. On a startup that we that ended up being called started out being called International Omnicorp. Okay. And then through one of those fancy stock maneuvers, we were a, I'm going to put fingers up acquired <laughs> by a group called the Penguin Group that was a penny stock on the stock exchange. Uh oh. <laughs> which suddenly made us a company on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay. All right. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Let's put it this way: when they were take, when there, we had like five or six employees at the time, and when they were putting the board of directors together, I was so uncomfortable with this that I wouldn't sit on the board. Oh wow! So, I lasted there, not even a not even a year. Okay. I it, it just it was the wrong fit for me. And from, so from that, I went back to freelancing and tabletop. It's uh, it's good to be self-aware about those things. Sometimes it's, you know, the path of least resistance is just to do it. And then, like, you don't even notice that you're unhappy <laughs> at this. Yeah, time. and that's it. Um, <laughs> when, when I quit, um, or when, excuse me, when I was fired, um, okay. <laughs> it was one of the best days of my life. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> awesome. Um, so you freelance for a while after that, and then mm -hmm. um, after after Penguin, um, I went back into freelance. Um, touch base with touch base with contacts in both the video game field and the um, the tabletop industry. Um, did a lot of artwork for Dungeon Magazine, Dragon Magazine. Then started editing TSR game adventures, and then started writing content for them and pre creating game content for them. And at the same time, working on, I have two major video game credits. Well, major um, from that time period. Also, um, so I did uh, 
four by four tabletop truck race or four by four truck racing for um, Epics, and they put that out on several platforms. Okay. And then I did the Lord of the Rings Volume One um, for Interplay. I wrote I wrote all the interior or ninety percent of the interior content for the game. Probably I actually wrote like two hundred percent of it, but. They didn't give me the specs for the design, so they produced the Reader's Digest version of what I wrote. Okay. Very. Com- they took. They took. Uh, they skimmed. A, <laughs> they skimmed a stone across the top. The top of what I wrote. Yeah. It j- just a, a. If I can get a, a personal question, is okay. Is that where you met Rebecca? No. Back at Interplay. No. Um, she was there at the time, but we never interact. We never met. Okay. Huh. Yeah, she was one of the founders of Venom. Well, I know. I, my, my point of contact was um, Brian Fargo initially because he was friends with Mike Stackpole. That was, that was the way in. And then um, I worked with a programmer named Troy Miles on the project. And cool. that, those are the only, you know, Troy was basically... Um, my only contact until Scott Benny, a designer from Canada, came in, and he was the internal designer who ended up um, taking it all the way through to market. Awesome. Um, and somewhere along the line, you you end up at, at TSR formally. We were an you were an, an employee at TSR. Um, yeah. I worked. I worked at TSR. Well, I worked freelance for TSR. TSR was one of my major game industry clients at that point. I, was, okay. I had other clients that weren't in the game industry. Um, but I got a call out of the blue. I've been going to, should say, I've been going to Gen Con. I've been meeting the people doing the art programs. I've met some of their staff artists. Um, and around this time, well, during that period, um, Keith Parkinson left. And then Clyde Caldwell left. Larry Elmore left. Clyde Caldwell left. Um, and so they were bringing in some new people. And then I got a call from some friends of mine who were running the art show at TSR for, for uh, Gen Con. And they said, hey, would you be interested in working um, on staff as, an, as a cover illustrator for TSR? And my wife at the time thought I was going to say, no, no, I wouldn't do that. Why would I move away from where I'm at? <laughs> and I was thinking, no, let's figure out Let's let's put the pros and cons together here. Yeah. And when I finally talked with um, the guy, the director of the group, I discovered two things. One, the pros were pretty good. Two, I had worked with him at Coleco. Okay. <laughs> he was right. um, he was in the art department. And he was the designer of packaging, but he was also a race car enthusiast. So while we were at well, Coleco was showing at the Consumer Electronics Show. He loaned them a small um, indie-style indie car to use as a demo for Turbo. Okay. Or at least as an, I, an attractor because we were selling the game Turbo. Well, they were letting people get inside the, the <laughs> cockpit. And I said, oh, that sounds fun. Can I try it? So I got in and I got stuck. Oh, no. <laughs> I have generously proportioned feet, and I could not remove them from where they were in down in the console. So oh, they no. had to partially disassemble the cowling on the vehicle to help me get out. Oh, boy. I think it's so they could get me to take my shoe off so I could then pull my foot out. No. So it's one of those embarrassing moments, but yeah. later on it led to a job because... Tom, uh, Tom Lavely remembered me. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> so I ended up um, interviewing with TSR in the summer, like July of 93. Okay. And then they had a hiring. Well, first of all, they had a hiring freeze. And then I interviewed with them. And then they had a hiring freeze. And so by September, um, I joined the company as an illustrator and then moved to the Lake Geneva area in November of that year. Okay, yeah. And that was just a, probably a few years before the Wizards of the Coast buyout, right? That was in 96. Oh, yeah, I was there three and a half years. Um, 
I went out the door literally a week or so. Um, if you've ever, if you've followed any of that story of um, how things happen, I walked out the door probably a week or so before um, Ryan Dancy came in to uh, start the process of the takeover. Wow. Just coincidentally, or, or you, you just kind um, of didn't like where things were headed? I had seen where things were headed. Um, yeah. Basically, what happened was is we had the we had the big layoffs, uh, the big layoff of, in December of '96, just before Christmas. Um, I actually sat in the conference room with the president, so I got to watch my coworkers walk out the door carrying boxes of stuff. So we could also see that the pres, you know, Lorraine Williams was very sad about this. Um, but then, like two weeks later. Um, or early, no, it was early January, I got invited to go be a guest at a RuneQuest convention in uh, suburban Chicago. And one of the other guests at the convention was uh, designer Sandy Peterson of id Software. And I had tried to hire Sandy to come work for me at Coleco some years before. Um, he wisely turned me down. I, in turn, he said, you should come work with us at id Software. You'd be a good fit for what we're doing there. And I said, okay. <laughs> and then I, I went, they, they flew me down for an interview in early February, uh, like February 7th. I spent a week on site learning the Quake 2 tools at the end of the week. Radiant. Um, <laughs> pardon? Radiant, I think, is the, the... Oh, this is before Radiant. This is... This Pre-Radiant, okay. <laughs> this was a cute Quake 2 edit. Yeah, I okay. It was, called. <laughs> it, was, it was the last real version of John Carmack's tools before we got better things. Yeah. Um, so he brought me... To, they brought me down. I interviewed for a week. I built some... Learned the tools, built stuff, got to meet the people, got to know the area a little bit. And the next Monday, they offered me... Um, a job working for them. They offered me a dollar figure. I asked for a bit more. We said, okay. And two, three weeks later, I was in Dallas. Wow. Awesome. Um, did you overlap Paul Steed there? Mm-hmm. Okay. I worked with Paul. He, from, <laughs> he left uh, from id. He came up to Seattle and worked at Wild Tangent. And we started yep. at that company the same week. I was there, yep. and I didn't know who he was at the time. He, I, he's, kind of, you know, kind of, I guess considered kind of a big deal. Uh, he was, he was certainly uh, how to be kind. Um, <laughs> he's an oversized character. <laughs> he was a character. Yeah, he was a character, and he was let go from ID for good reason, and those reasons showed up again in his later career until. Basically, it ended tragically. Yeah, yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah, I'll give I'll give one uh, not to go on a, too much of a tangent, but I'll give one Paul Steed uh, anecdote. Uh, I, I didn't know who he was. We were just you know the new guys at the company, so we kind of became buddies. And uh, I'd go shoot pool with them. We'd go you know drink beer and shoot pool pretty mm -hmm. regularly on the weekends. And uh, so the a couple of things would happen every time. <laughs> He would almost get in a fight, <laughs> but not actually fight anybody. And then right at the end of the night, you know, you know, you kind of pace yourself, you know, you're having some beers. Okay, closing time, you know, switch to water, you know, I'm going to drive home. Shots of tequila <laughs> would show up right at bar closing from Paul. I'm like, you mother. <laughs> yeah. Well, even say, even it did software, the, um, the late night alcohol trips were fairly common we would go i think we ended up going there was a bar down the street from us that we would end up occasionally at and they made friends with the night the bartender the late night bartender and i think he got eventually got in trouble for making free shots for the id guys yeah <laughs> so That's, that sounds about that was right. part of the culture here as well and yeah that sounds exactly like the paul steed i knew yeah, he was uh, he was a firecracker, <laughs> to put it politely. <laughs> um, so let's let's go back in time a little bit. I want to I want to I want to talk about Judges Guild a, a little bit. 
Caverns of Thracia is a judges guild okay. adventure. Um, Bob Bledsoe, did you, you you didn't work on site, so you, I assume you you met him when you interviewed him, but you probably didn't. Oh yeah, I I, I met him. Um, I would see him again at conventions um, because I would when they were in, when they were in the area, they came up for some conventions in Michigan. I would go up there with them and work the convention with them. I worked a couple Gen Cons with them, even after I left. Um, and it was, um, I'm going to say that I didn't really like Bob, for whatever it's worth. Oh, really? <laughs> I did yeah. not get along with him. Fair enough, fair enough. That, that's it. I just, you know, it just wasn't, I, but at the same time, I'm going to say that I was really a, pretty much a prima donna, too. Okay. <laughs> Fair I, I, I knew was I knew I was probably the best racehorse in the stable. And <laughs> all right, that's cool. <laughs> um, I didn't know that Judges Guild existed until until more recently. I, I grew up in in California, and so I think you know Red Box Mensa Red Box. So probably what was that like? A I've actually got this timeline thing here. Um, so that was around like 83, 84 that that came out. The, the game stores in L.A. that I would go to didn't carry Judges Guild stuff. I, I didn't know well, the thing. By that point, Judges Guild was on its way out. Yeah. Judges Guild started um, in 76, late you know, 76, 77. They peaked around 78, 79, 80. Yeah. And... Then they were already on a downward arc because uh, G- uh, TSR had taken away the um, D- the AD and D license. Right. D and D wasn't their best seller. They overproduced content, or they overproduced stuff. And compared to what TSR was producing at the time, and some of the other publishers by that point, the Judges Guild stuff looked cheap and schlocky. Yeah. It was, and by say by 1983, when you were getting into it, Judges Guild was all but done. Pretty much gone at that they, point. They yeah. were producing unlicensed stuff. They were producing stuff for small games that, you know, also ran games or things like that. It just, yeah, they were they they were winding down. Okay, one one thing. So so this is kind of new to me. I've started collecting Judges Guild stuff. Um, and one thing that I've found really impressive is just the maps, like the, just the craftsmanship and the maps. Here's, here's one of them from, I forget which, which installment this was, but they are very beautifully executed. Like, mm-hmm. uh, they look like a proper draftsman did them. I don't know if that was Bob Pan. From or what I understand, background. Bob, Bob Ledsaw was a proper draftsman. Yeah. Um, he I wasn't a part of those. I think from what I'm looking at, he did a lot of those with um, press on tape, maybe black the black tape that okay. was pop, being used for uh, line work for printing and, and drafting. Um, that wasn't my style, but I have my own style. Yeah, and and Wilderlands is is sort of the the campaign setting that that Judges Guild mm-hmm. uh, came up with. Caverns of Thracia and I think Dark Tower Two are are not set in in Wilderlands. No, not not specifically. I think there's some suggestions where they might be. Okay. Um, when I did the Book of Treasure maps, um, which was one of those projects I didn't want to do. <laughs> yeah. But they made me. Okay. <laughs> it ended up coming out really well, but um, those I was required to locate somewhere in, in the realms. Got it. Yeah. Well, and you know, like at the time when when some of these are being released, the Wilderlands books and some of the adventures, you know, at that point we'd only had the Greyhawk supplement and the Blackhawk supplement, which really were not so much campaign settings yet. They were no. the Greyhawk book was new rules, monsters, and treasure. Blackmore had the Temple of the Frog map, but I, I don't know. I, I'm wondering if and kind of thinking is is Wilderlands sort of the first campaign setting? It could be for D and D. TSR didn't see, from as I understand it, TSR didn't see the market for content, adventure content, 
until Judges Guild showed that there was one. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. And then, then yeah, so there was this, there's a four year gap between D and D launches and the first TSR module G one comes out. Mm -hmm. So Judges Guild had a couple of years span in there where, where, you know, we warriors and Judges Guild were kind of the only kids on the block putting adventures out. And, and Judges Guild, you say they brought me on in 78. Um, they had a lot of, they had the in-house people, uh, Bob and Dave Searing and, um, a couple other people who were original to the company and they were turning the crank. They produced those, the, those supplements that you've been showing on, on, the, your forum. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So they were they were turning the crank there. They were producing stuff. They were sending out these subscriptions, um, and then throwing in some of the adventures along the side of them. And then eventually, I think the subscriptions kind of faded away, and it was just the adventure content. Okay, yeah, just just you know, published adventures for sale. Um, here's a question. So so, you know, Judges Guild, right? I, I guess, you know, we sort of use the term DM or Dungeon Master now, but but. In, in several of these Judges Guild books that I'm reading, it, it sounds like that wasn't the term that was used then. It was like judge. They used Judges Guild for whatever per, whatever the reason they used the term judge. Yeah. It, I, I don't know if that was... Was that true of TSR as well? Where the, where, no. Did they call it Dungeon Master like immediately? Yeah, it was Dungeon When I got into gaming in 75, 76, it was DM, Dungeon Master. Okay. Um, a couple other games later, genericized it to Game Master. Um, I tend to use referee now when I'm working. Okay. Mainly just to eliminate the word master from it. Okay. <laughs> I can see that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and a shout out to there's, there's a Judges Guild Facebook group if anybody uh, is watching and is interested in, in, in connecting with other people that are uh, interested in this stuff. That's a good place. Um, before we sort of move on to the next topic, I want to. I've seen a couple of videos uh, called, you know, something to do with jayquazing the dungeon. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a term yeah. that has come to be. Can Can you talk about that a little bit? What does that What does that mean to you? Um, I discovered someone had done um, that. I'm, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name, but um, there was a blogger. A games uh, tabletop game blogger who had gone through my older adventures and determined that I had a system. A okay. <laughs> um, that there were things that I was doing right, and that if you follow, if you use these techniques and trick, these you know one clever trick, um, you can create more. More, more better game adventures. Right. Um, create game adventures that play better. And I didn't know he was doing this until either somebody told me or I stumbled on them around early 2012. Okay. And I went through and I looked at it and go, yeah, but that was just what I did. That's how I did things. And then I would go back into stuff I've written later and said, am I Jake wazing this properly? <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's, it's cool. the whole it basically boils down to design a venture to incorporate nonlinearity. Um, video games have gotten us used to the idea early video games got us used to the idea that we played a game in a linear fashion um, railroaded yeah a lot of um, D&D adventures often did the same and it got kind of bad in the late 80s basically Dragonlance basically told us now you have to play out this story here we've got the Dragonlance books but through the adventures you can replay the story of the adventures yeah and so you're kind of expected to play that way which is a um, little bit of a departure from kind of the formula of D&D up to that point yeah yeah and I kind of the way I designed was the idea that if I've got a room with two doors I have to be able to design, and I can come at it from two different hallways. I have to design with the ideas that if I come at it from hallway A, 
some, this one thing happens. If I come out from hallway B, having gone through more of the adventure, something else can happen. And the idea is that this is making the dungeon be more alive because there's actually, now you're kind of bringing in, reacting to actual stimulus rather than I open the door and there's 10 orcs to I open the door and I find 10 orcs sleeping or I open the door and 10 orcs are sharpening their weapons having just woken up and eaten lunch. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's interesting too, like part, part, part of my intent in, in sort of playing through these adventures through time is to sort of see how things evolve, the rules, write, writing style, dungeon design, all of that. And you look at Palace of the Vampire Queen, and it is very bare bones, right? There's maps with a key of numbers and just what is in there and the treasure. There's no, nothing's mm -hmm. descriptive. And now you get to Caverns of Thracia, and there were some, you know, other adventures before uh, between those two. But, yeah, th there's tons of description and, and a lot more complexity in the map layouts. And, yeah, there's a lot more going on for sure. Um, let's let's take a little tangent to uh, before we get into the the main event, Caverns of Thracia. Uh, a, a, just a little uh, touch into the TSR era. Um, do you have any favorite thing that you worked on there, or or funny anecdotes from your time at TSR? Well, the funny thing, the the best and the funniest thing was probably um, my first day at TSR. One of my friends who worked in the in the design department, because I went in as an artist, um, and I didn't work with the designers directly. He said he kind of did this in um, hazing indoctrination. <laughs> okay. That they called the mask of valor. Okay. It was and essentially, what it was is you put on a fencing mask with its mesh front, and you let them throw darts, plastic, narrow tip darts at the mask. Where they tried to stick it through the through the mesh. Oh no! <laughs> and hitting your body uh, from time. Oh well, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're not sharp. <laughs> they're just they're just pointy. All right. <laughs> awesome. So that was that was probably one of the, the more humorous things. Um, the, the the company had a lot of tragedy at the same time. But um, my favorite project that I worked on probably had to as a both as a manager and as a designer artist was um, Dragon Dice. Uh, I did um, I did the design design style that was used for Dragon Dice, the, the, the dice faces, not the boxes. Okay. I still think the boxes were horrible. Um, and then I painted a number of the covers for the, for the expansion packs. But I've done over half the, of all the dice sets that are out there, I've probably done over half of the faces on them. Oh, wow. So awesome. I really like that one. And then there was another product that didn't do so well in the company um, that was just getting started as the company died, which was um, Marvel Dice. Okay. Marvel, based on Marvel superheroes. And my role on that was as artist. I converted, I basically did icons to represent dozens, maybe even hundreds of the Marvel characters as small dice icons. Oh, wow. Very I'm cool. very proud of that work. Awesome. Unfortunately, only one set of them ever got done, but I did the Fantastic Four. I did an X-Men expansion. We did a lot of the X-Men. Um, I'm well, very that's... proud of that work. Awesome. That's a bummer. I haven't seen those. That's a bummer that they uh, so much it... never came out. Came and it, it, it did come out just the first basic set. Yeah, and that was and then poof. Um, well, let's dig into Caverns of Thracia. So here is my, my personal copy <laughs> that we're about to go through. It's in uh, mind marking on. Oh, you got yours too. All right, awesome. mine's a little dog-eared. Okay, <laughs> this one has not been played before. It's in uh, very good condition. I'm excited about that. Uh, I've also got your giant heavy deluxe collector's edition ah, which has the which has the adventure in it yeah it's in here too uh man this this is a, a honker of a book uh, i have it was fun to work yet. on yeah 
So cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to sort of dig into that. We'll probably, as we go through the adventure, kind of like flop around in this book a little bit too and talk about you know some of the stuff that are in there. Um, so Caverns of Thracia. Um, this was some, something I was supposed to look up. How many adventures had been published up to that point? There okay. was... I think I looked that up. Um, I think it was by Caverns of Thracia was my fifth. I had done, for Dungeoneer, I had done um, the Chalrax Tomb, Borshak's Lair, and uh, Night of the Walking Wet. Okay. Those were the three adventures I did in the Dungeoneer. Then when I started the Judge's Guild, I wrote another um, large, larger adventure that appeared in the, one of the first issues of Dungeoneer that Judge's Guild produced. And then it was, it was um, Dark Tower. Okay. And then after that, so Caverns of Thracia, I believe, was my sixth adventure. Awesome. Published. And had you played other published adventures uh, ahead of this? No. Or you're just kind of making your own? <laughs> I just made my own. Yeah. Awesome. Um, time to complete. So I'm, I'm kind of like comparing, you know, so we just finished Palace of the Vampire Queen. It was all of 16 pages long, I think. Uh, maybe, maybe it was 32. Uh, this is 77 ish pages long. Um, yep, seven, well, actually, 78. I think there's, uh, there's probably fewer rooms in Caverns of Thracia. We finished, um, Palace of Emperor Queen in, in about twenty sessions. I'm wondering how long we should expect this to take. Have you have you gotten reports from people how long they spent in it? No, but people make campaigns out of it. Yeah, yeah. So I don't I don't really know. And there's even a good chance you won't see all of the adventure. Yeah, true. Like the unless the, unless you force your characters in certain <laughs> places or they're super explorey. Yeah, completionist. You know, <laughs> some some or the barbarian explorer. Yeah. Um, because um, there's, there's a lot of a lot of sub levels, a lot of um, in between spaces. Yeah, and that's that that's kind of an, an unusual sort of style of layout. Um, but it's it's really cool how they sort of connect together, and you've got like shelf things that go up to, into other spots. Um, it was fun. Nice. Can you tell us about Thanatos at all? He he is the the god. That, that is introduced in the beginning of uh, Caverns of Thracia. Um, does, does he make an appearance in other? Uh, no, as far as I part? know, no. Um, I think he's the, he may be referenced in the Unknown Gods. Okay. Um, but other than that, no. I mean, Thanatos I wrote specifically... In fact, I may even have done it so that I could do this image in the book. Let's see if I can find it real quickly. I don't think it got printed this way. I may have done it simply so I could do this two color illustration. Yeah. Here. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I, yeah. I remember that. Very cool. Um, um, but yeah, it's basically he was, well, that's called the incarnation of death. So that was a monster. Um, yeah. But he's basically, I made him up and, Probably loosely based on uh, the names, um, not based on any Marvel comics. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, there, there is a little naming similarity there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I was impressed with are the wandering monster tables. I'll, I'll sort of put that up here. Um, they are very uh, more detailed than than uh, I am used to in in older and even modern adventures. You've got sort of breakout tables for like what flavor of knoll party will be there and a chance to roll double on them. Uh, yeah, that, that well, was impressive. Can you talk about the that? whole intent was to make it feel like a place rather than you bump into someone wandering the halls at night looking for you know a midnight snack. No, there'd be there this, this was where people. This is where people monsters as people live and. You would, they would be protecting it. They would be patrolling the halls. Um, it was to try and make it feel more like a 
place rather than a dungeon. Yeah, and I and I get a I get a feel for that reading through it where some some of the monster areas sort of have defensive positions to guard against the other monsters that are in different parts of it. That was a that was a nice touch. Faction play. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, one thing I noticed this is just maybe a, 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 a silly tangent, but I noticed that the formatting of the monster blocks where there were some are are A D and D style. Um, as opposed to um, OD and D, and this... there is a story there. Okay, good. <laughs> and I didn't even I didn't even realize um, after the fact that there was a difference. But I did um, Dark Tower for AD and D. When but when I started working on the Caverns of Thracia, I started working on it for AD and D. Okay. During the process of writing the module. Judges Guild had the A, D, and D license taken away from them. Oh. They had the D and D. They could still do D and D, but they could not specifically do A, D, and D. This was partly because TSR wanted more control over the structure of A, D, and D adventures. And they had finally seen the market. By this point, they were selling. They were actually selling the uh, against the giants and the uh, the drow series. That's right. Yeah, they they had come out maybe a little shy of a year ahead of Caverns of Thracia coming out. Yeah, I think they I think they sold them at the end of either at Gen Con in seventy eight or at the end of Origins, because at the Origins game adventure was when. They were actually running them as tournament modules. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna share screen here. I've got a little bit of visuals if I can figure out these buttons here. Um, but show some of that entire screen. Yeah. So here's uh, a little. This is a Prezi that I made. A little interactive timeline of of Dungeons and Dragons over time stuff. But yeah, the, so the G series comes out in 78 and yeah you, they all have these little little badges on the bottom of them for what what uh convention they were used in origin 78 mm-hmm. and then, so, i was at that convention i didn't play those but i was there okay cool uh i just went to my first uh, con last year uh, i went to my first gen con in 2022 <laughs> congratulations yeah i, I had fun. did my last one in 2003 i think Okay, so you haven't you haven't gone for uh, no. quite a bit, yeah. So here's Caverns of Thracia. I think Dark Tower was came out a little before it. If I might yes. not order this wrong, and then Book of Treasure Maps is a little bit yeah, later. Yeah, it was later. Nice. Um, one uh, here was a, a question that came up for me. I'm looking at uh, fifty three room comp. There's there's a room where you mentioned. The, the doors, if you get into them, they take you to the prime material plane. Uh, let me look this up real quick. I believe it is on, is that level two? No, I think it's level three. Um, and, and here's, so the, yeah, room complex 53, A through J. So A has, it's sort of a, a room with a bunch of doors that are that on one side that I'll take you to the prime material plane. Now, up to this point in time, so the, the Dungeon Master's Guide comes out like right around when Caverns of Thracia is released, right? Mm-hmm. It came out um, at Gen Con in 79. Okay. Prime material plane is a concept. I think, is that where it gets introduced, the Dungeon no. Master's Guide? I'll show you here. Is that the player's handbook? It's actually in the back of the player's handbook. Okay. It came out in 77. <laughs> All right. There you go. Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, I wasn't sure with, with the timing of that or, or where the... No, where... I went and looked that up. Cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Because I didn't know. I mean, I know I didn't originate it, but I didn't know where it came from. I thought it might have been in the um, either in Blackmore or in um, the one that came after, the supplement that came after it. The yeah, there was there was Eldritch Wizardry. Eldritch Wizardry, the one with the, the naked lady on the cover. Yeah. 
Um, here, one question I'm, I'm having as I'm reading through too is 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 motivation for players to go in here. Now, you know, I don't know. The, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's just there. Go explore it and get 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 money and treasure. Um, there is a table of like tavern, like rumors and stuff. Um, so I'm thinking about tying it in to, you know, see, seeing if I can have tie-ins there. Maybe tie in our last adventure. But yeah, that's was, I, I wasn't. Yeah, you know, some adventures will have like the motivation there. Yeah. But this kind of doesn't, right? It's just I don't. I by that I don't think I was doing that at that time. I would I would pick up doing that with some later adventures um, for for. Um, Chaosium, but at that time I wasn't doing tavern rumors. Okay. Um, yeah, and it it, it 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 can be kind of a railroady thing, right? If you tell them mm-hmm. why why they're there, then then it it kind of takes away the possibility of of just fitting it into your adventure and why your players are doing whatever they are. Um, so, and since this is a first level, yeah, that's one thing I haven't quite nailed down yet. Is is why, why are you guys here? <laughs> I say one of the one of the things I've done more lately, and one of my published books I published more recently, um, I I think I devoted about two pages to um, hooks with story, you know, with story of why you would go in to explore this area, and then allow the game master to say, oh, I like this hook better, and then use that one. You know, or use this one that yeah. fits the way their players play. One one uh, hook that I thought of in, in the last adventure, our players we're going to make new characters, so they're not going to continue on because it's going to be they're already level five or so. But they found a treasure map in the palace of the vampire queen, so I'm thinking about having them. And, and then I ran over and I grabbed my copy of the book of treasure maps. Oh I'm dear! Like, I'm like, it's one of these. <laughs> So, although, although yeah, I, I might just kind of bullshit that like caverns of Thracia is is like how it leads you guys well, where you guys. One go. of the things that you could do is there's nothing that says you can take one of those those book of treasure map adventures and kind of push the rest of the dungeon down a level and have that be your your entry level. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I did stuff like that all the time. <laughs> totally. Um, I'm expecting a, a group of probably. Let's see. We we generally have about seven eight players on average. I've I've got three or four new players interested in joining for caverns. Do you have any suggestions for me for for adjusting for a large group? Most adventures aren't designed for you know thirteen fourteen people. I would tend to well first of all from a play stand from a player standpoint, I'd make your characters divide up into squads. Yeah. You know. Take a senior, have a senior, one of the senior players, more advanced players, basically take lead roles in the squads, and you have them explore different areas simultaneously and then get back together. Maybe they don't have the exact same experience, but they're not all in the same place at once. Um, one of the things you can do with, because it's uh, not um, D&D 5e, um, you can probably just up the monster content. Yeah. yeah Except where you're dealing with, more. you know, bosses or something. Um, you can just kind of bring in more cannon fodder. Yeah. And there's some cool bosses in here. I'm excited for them to meet <laughs> some of them. Um, yeah, there's one of the bosses that's fairly deep into the adventure. Um, another one of my friends keeps asking, are you going to do anything? Are they going to do anything with this character? Boy, I hope they feature this character. <laughs> um, and they did. Awesome, awesome. Uh, one in our in our last run, one thing that we we kind of did the not formally, but the party did sort of tend to split up into little squads. Mm-hmm. And you would think that it was, you know, there's with a party that large, it's you know, it can get loud and chaotic, and and you you think it could like slow things up. I mm-hmm. like, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, uh, well, let me check my spell book. One thing that I did that was helpful with when they did separate is is whenever anybody stalled at all, meanwhile, you just go you go to the other group and like, what are you guys doing? And so that gives them a minute to breathe and figure it out and then like, okay, we're going to do stuff over here. It, 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 it was, it kind of led a fun, fast-paced, like back and forth chaos to it that I, that I kind of yeah. liked. 
Well, we can. This is again. This has been a very long time since I played these games. Um, we would play when we were playing at someone's house or in their apartment. We would, if someone decided I'm going to do independent adventure, or if a group broke off, they went in another room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they had no idea. I would, you know, the, the game master would get back to them, but they were not in the room where it happened. Nice, nice. At the time. You have a side DM for <laughs> the other. Well, group. It, you basically you just like you were saying. You just meanwhile alternating play. Yeah. Until figure, people figure, oh, I want to play all the time. Let's get back together in the same group. Um, At least the survivors. <laughs> One uh, looking through the credits of the book, there old woodcuts is is I assume not a person, but is probably these things. Oh. They're, as far as I understand, I didn't you have to understand how this worked. When I did my work, I would do illustrations. Okay. I, would, I would write text on a typewriter. Often I would cut and paste pieces together yeah. um, to make my man, final manuscripts. And then I would send those paste ups to Judges Guild, along with the arts and maths. I had nothing to do with typesetting and production on <laughs> right. these products. Um, so I think they did filler art so that they could have color. Because I use color on maps and illustrations kind of liberally throughout the book. Okay. I think they put in filler art so they could push some parts further into it. And... Those were probably Gustav Doré prints or something, who, which would have been in the public domain at that time. Okay. I mean, I'm working the current my current project. Um, I'm going to say half the artwork in it is public domain that okay. I have manipulated um, to make it fit my book. Cool, cool. Um, I found one bit that I had a question on two. I'm not going to remember what room number this is, so it's going to be hard to look up. Um, there's a there's a room with a seal on a scroll, scroll that has a dangerous spell on it. Um, I forget what room it is. I'm debating if I should have that spell. Uh, is it a spell that the players can learn, or should I just have it go off and blow up the party? <laughs> uh, so I don't remember what what spell it was. Yeah. Convention adventures, I'll sometimes throw in magic items for the characters that I know are going to be misused. Yeah. Because it's more fun that way. Yeah, yeah. We, we've we've had some some uh, pretty great shenanigans of, of magic items gone wrong uh, in, in the last adventure. One, one we had was... He rolled a 99 on the magic sword table, which is cursed sword. <laughs> so to in order to like not tell give a tell, I, I, I kind of made up that it was like, oh, you know, it's a it's an undead slayer something or a, I just made up a bullshit thing. And then uh, it wouldn't let him it wouldn't attack anything but undead. And so he got super frustrated with the thing and he melted it in a rust monster. But yeah, <laughs> shenanigans. Uh one of the one little bit that cracked me up, uh, room 102 must is probably my favorite room in here, uh, which is not on the map. <laughs> you, the mysterious missing chamber. It's, oh my! <laughs> you read it? Uh, I don't people. remember, but um... it's funny. Uh, it's as look as you might. You will not find this room on the map. It was never there and only exists in the mind of the designer, who refused to admit that they may have made an oversight in numbering his creation and doesn't feel like sticking the number 102 <laughs> somewhere on the map. And I don't know, know if I wrote... That sounds like something I might have written. <laughs> I wonder if... Uh, there, there's talk of a Goodman Games remake of this. I wonder if they'll do something different with Room 102 or... It's entirely it possible. Um, <laughs> I have not seen the content that they did for the Dark Tower version. So okay. I trust... I trust the two designers doing the major bulk of the work to to handle my babies with care. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Um, do you have any DM tips for me while while I'm running Caverns of Thracia? Mm. How do you run secret doors? 
Yeah, good question. So we do it sort of just by by the OD and D rules, which is to say, elves. I think on a roll of one, it's either one or one or two. Just walking by. There's a lot of secret doors in in this. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Um, and then otherwise, it has to be intentionally like verbally, you know, specified by the players. And then it's like a, I think a one through four for elves, and like a one or one or two for humans and other races. Yeah. I think we. T- I don't think we did the when I was design- playing, which would have affected the way I designed. I don't think we did a lot of passive uh, detection for secret doors, which okay. explains why I've had to actually, when I've been working on games now for um, more modern play, is I take some of my older adventures and I convert them, and I've got all these secret doors, and I realize, okay, the secret doors are actually guiding play. Because we have you have characters who t- elves who sense them, um, magic spells, um, and five E. I think it even gets worse. So yeah, um, you've got to the the secret. You're going to find that if you have players actively sensing for secret doors, that's probably going to guide the direction of play they take. Okay, so you would say do do use the passive stuff like well, actually like, no, I would say no make. I'd say make, no. Make them, make, them, make them work for make it. Them look, okay. Make them work yeah, for there, it. Yeah, there are some areas where it's like you're pretty much dead ended until you find some some secret doors. Right. So get to search. Get to looking. <laughs> and the other thing is a door that's secret from one direction. You know, the description on the other side may, it may not be secret. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I noticed a few instances where it's it's visible from one end only. Mm-hmm. Um. A couple of uh, a couple of tangents now. Well, Dark Tower. It's I've seen it in lists of the top ten greatest adventures of all time. Uh, one of the only ones that's not a TSR adventure. In fact, it's the only one. Yeah, at that time that was not a TSR adventure. Can Can you talk about that a little bit? What What do you What is it that you think makes Dark Tower specifically great? And and just what makes for a great adventure in in your mind? Um. A good adventure for me is one that provides a variety of opportunities for the, for the players to solve it. That it's not just all we bash the monsters or we have to have this certain special spell. That every challenge has more than one way to be solved. I mean, that's I feel that's true of both game adventures and, say, video games. Yeah. Um, it's got... You can choose your own path through it. There, it's not a railroad. It is a good adventure. Is a setting for the player's story. It is not a story to be played out. Yeah. The story is the players. It's not the GMs. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, can you give us any any news on? There's been talk of a Goodman Games remake of Caverns of Thracia. What 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 do you know uh, about I that? I actually know <laughs> very little. I've seen the cover art quite some time ago. I had some help in guiding what went on the cover art. Um, I thought they were going to be announcing it recently at uh, at GaryCon. Um, because they asked me for some anecdotes, anecdotes they could share during a live cast. Okay. I wasn't a part of that because it's a internal live cast only. Um, beyond that, I don't know. Okay. I well, think I know they're wrapping. I think they they just wrapped up production on the Dark Tower book. Um, once you get all the design and all the layout done, usually the art trickles in takes a while to do when you've got that much material it takes a while to get all the art done yeah yeah for sure um well cool just we'll keep our eyes peeled <laughs> for i'm, yeah. I'm i, I like- started and uh, i'm excited to get my i've got a proper you know old copy of dark tower i'm excited to get the new goodman games one and yeah i'll keep keep eyes out for this one too um, last question before we go. Tell us what you're working on now. I've seen some stuff about central casting. Can you can you talk about okay. that? A bajillion years ago, back in the Dark Ages, um, I wrote 
a character history generator. It's a, it's a type called a life path where you walk through creating the background, the backstory of a fantasy character. I did it again for science fiction. I did it again for contemporary. So there were three books back in the late 80s, early 90s. Come forward, I own the rights to those, at least the first book in the series now. So I decided about five years ago that I would redo it and right. create central <laughs> casting legendary heroes, um, which is a reboot, ground up, literally a ground up reboot of the first book. First book was 100 pages. This one turned out to be 1250. <laughs> well, 1250. Whoa, what the hell? <laughs> a lot of content. I read a lot of content, and I didn't, I didn't let my editor publisher head say, oh, you should only write this much content. I just kept writing, yeah. and it will fill three <laughs> volumes. Um, I'm in the process right now of getting the art finalized for it. The layout is done. The design is done. The editing is done. Um, it's just collecting hundreds of pieces of artwork. And getting them in place. Yeah, it's time consuming. Um, is there a is there a target date that you want to have this out? <sighs> Probably my target is to launch it sometime maybe this summer. Okay. So, um, so coming soon. I'm gonna I'm at the point right now I'm going to be designing the covers. I've already poked my, my cover artist um, but I need the artwork in so I can finalize the colors for the cover and then I'm gonna start um, getting print bids. Awesome. We'll keep an eye, an eye out for that too. Um, that is about all the questions I, I have for you. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really pleased to have uh, some time with you to talk about just you, your career, your amazing career, this adventure. I can't wait to dig into it with my players. So yeah, thank you very, very much for, for coming on with us, uh, Janelle. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, if anybody wants to watch our, our live play of this, we're going to be playing it every Saturday uh, from 12 o'clock to 4 uh, Eastern Time. Our, and our first session is, is this coming up Saturday in, in just a few days away. Um, we can be found on... So my, my Twitch and YouTube are, are both undertone underscore DJ. Um, there will be, uh, the episodes will be put up onto YouTube after uh, as well. So if anyone wants to check out an, an OD and D playthrough of this thing, <laughs> uh, there we go. Do you have any, uh, social media that you want to shout out before we go? Um, if you want to follow, um, my work projects, um, I'm most active on, uh, Facebook. I have a, a professional page called, uh, Janelle Jakeway's artist, I think. Okay. Um, just search, search out my name by spelling it properly, and you should be able to find me on <laughs> Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter, but I don't know for how much longer. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't used mine <laughs> in a while. Thank you again very much for coming on, Janelle. It's been really a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm.